Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Tommy Vitor. Uh, Lovett is, of course, a devout Christian, so uh, he's taken one more day to fully celebrate Easter. And then he will have risen. <laughs> Maybe that worked. Yeah, I think it worked. <laughs> On today's show, Trump's apprentice-style veep stakes has begun. Wall Street billionaires are coming to his rescue. His truth social stock is tanking. Lost a billion dollars today. Uh, and he continues to attack and threaten his political opponents and their families. Uh, meanwhile, Joe Biden reaches out to Nikki Haley voters and move over Beyonce because RNC chair Lara Trump has dropped a banger. Oof. <laughs> yeah. She is. Uh, but first, I hope all who celebrate had a happy Easter uh, because the most online partisan Republicans certainly did not. Everyone from Trump and Mike Johnson on down was outraged, outraged that Joe Biden issued a proclamation on Transgender Day of Visibility, as he has for the last four years without controversy. But the reason Republicans had a fit this year is because uh, Transgender Day of Visibility, which has been March 31st for the last 15 years, happened to fall on Easter Sunday. And the idea that a devout Catholic like Biden would dare to tell a group of Americans who've been targeted by hate and discrimination that they're loved and included on Easter of all days was too much for the anti-trans community. Uh, to celebrate the day of trans visibility in and of itself is an affront to Christianity, but it's also a random day created by a random person out of Michigan in the same way that I could declare March 30th is the day of Lisa. Well, recognize it another day, not on Easter Sunday. It's an affront to the Bible. Well, this is a clear effort and a coordinated effort to remove God from our society and to replace God with false gods. And in this instance, it's the trans community. <laughs> why false do we re gods? What? Why did we replace God with the trans God? I didn't know we did that. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't too surprised that this became a thing on the right. No. I didn't expect the magnitude of the freak out. Uh, what did you make of the war on Easter? I, I just, it's so manufactured I and mean, we're so used to this manufactured outrage we're probably kind of numb to it but it is exhausting and relentless and it's just the republicans are able to do this in part because they have the media infrastructure to amplify it and they kick it up uh and then the you know because fox covers it you get a bunch more republicans who put out statements and then it becomes a bigger thing and the utterly phony nature of this uh, faux outrage was best embodied by Caitlyn Jenner, mm. who on uh, March 31st, 2017, tweeted a uh, hashtag trans day of visibility. There's no better visibility than with sisters by my side as a photo of Caitlyn with some of her friends. Uh, and then this weekend tweeted, I am absolutely disgusted that Joe Biden has declared the most holy of holy days, a self-proclaimed devout Catholic as transgender day of visibility. The only thing you should be declaring on this day is he all caps, is risen. So I don't know. I guess Caitlyn Jenner is fine with people saying she doesn't deserve to exist uh, on certain days. But, you know, you, we've seen this a million times in the Obama years. The mainstream media then covers the controversy that's get kicked up by Fox News. And here we are. It it broke through in such a way and so quickly that it like got to all the normies in my life. Me too. It's a that's why I was like, okay, I get this. Like in 2015, 16, 2012, it could be like a, a couple segments on a Fox show, a couple Fox hosts, a right wing radio. The fact that we had the fucking Speaker of the House, Donald Trump, not really surprised there, no. and like Republican governors, Republican congressmen, like it was everywhere. It's yeah. So and it's so fucking phony, and you know it's phony because. Now that they've all been corrected because they were all wrong because Joe Biden didn't pick the day and the day just happened to fall on Easter because these people don't know how fucking calendar works or they're all supposed to be devout Christians, but they don't get that Easter Sunday means that it's a different date it's every Sunday, year, yeah. that it's been around for 15 years, that Biden has you know proclaimed it, has, has issued a proclamation for the last four years. Uh, they're still doing it. They were still doing it today. They're just they're, like they didn't they didn't back down even a hint because they it's, it's just phony. No one's mad at Christ for resurrecting on Trans Visibility <laughs> Day. You know what I mean? Why don't you ever hear that? I, what did you make of the fact that the Trump statement drew a distinction between Catholics and Christians? I'm no Huguenot, but that you know <laughs> that had my spidey sense. I know I heard people saying that it is a like a it's a historic sort of slight from Protestants to Catholics. I think they did it because Trump was very annoyed after the last election that he didn't get more of the Catholic vote mm. partly. And I think that's partly because Biden won back some white working class voters and Biden's Catholic. Right. And so I think that they are 
targeting they really want the catholic vote and so they thought they would go after catholics but specifically but, even though it doesn't make any sense but it's catholics seen as are a Christians. slight on catholics it's a, it's a suggestion that you're not really a christian you're a catholic you're an other thing right <laughs> well it says christians and catholics right? to the millions of catholics and christians but i mean right. one, oh yeah oh you think should it's encompass slight, catholics it of, it of course does one would think it I of don't. course does but what really annoys me about this too like this isn't some policy debate about you know, gender affirming care or high school sports. It is simply just recognizing trans people, yeah, just... a nice message of love and inclusion. And it's like, how does that how does that hurt you? Right? Like even if you think being trans isn't compatible with Christianity, which I would say is bullshit, like how does it affect you to have this fucking statement out? It's just childish. I mean I, I think that it got to the normies in people's lives. I think because there was the the first sort of round of stories on the made up controversy suggested that Joe Biden chose this day. He chose right. Easter Sunday and, and they didn't have the context of this. It's always been the 31st and that's been the case for 15 years. And of, with all lies, like it, that took a lot of time to catch up to people who are reading about the story or maybe never will. Yeah, that's right. Uh, were you also enraged that the White House Easter egg contest doesn't allow for submissions that include religious symbols, which has apparently been the case for the last 45 years. <laughs> I had to read about this one five times to try to get it, and I still don't think I do. So so the White House works with the American Egg Board <laughs> to put yes. on yeah. the Easter egg roll, which is an event on the, the South Lawn on Easter Sunday. My only experience of the Easter egg roll was uh, one year I got my cousin Jeremy tickets, mm. and he went with his daughter's. Uh, and then I asked if he wanted to go again next year. And he was like, nah, we're good. We're good. <laughs> it is very crowded. I think it was very crowded. A lot of screaming kids sweating on a lawn. So whatever. But uh, I guess, yeah, they don't allow religious egg designs. They haven't since 1976. It was Gerald Ford doing, I guess. I, but I guess my reaction was, who cares? But also, why not? If some little goober wants to make an egg with a crucifixion on it, like have at it. I'd... I don't get it either because there was a, the, the, it's the same language they've used for 45 years. Yeah. And it's like no offensive symbols, no partisan symbols, and also no overtly religious symbols. I imagine it's some kind of like, you know, civil rights, liberties language where right. separation, church and state yes. and all that kind of stuff. Like, but, you know, like, like if you want to come to the Easter egg roll with a big picture of Jesus on your shirt. Great. Just yeah. don't put it on the fucking egg. I, I, I don't I, I guess or put it on the egg. So anyway, that's what's going on with Joe Biden on Easter. Uh, here's a fun uh, CNN Chiron that was uh, blaring across the television screen yesterday. Trump spends Easter Sunday posting on social media about, quote, people that I completely and totally despise. <laughs> he, he went on a real tirade on uh, on his, his his fake Twitter. He also posted about, uh, quote, the crucifixion of Donald Trump. Mm hmm. Uh, that's, that's of course it's appropriate. That's yeah, appropriate it's for Easter. As we speak. Uh, and he posted uh, two pieces that call Trump, uh, quote, a miracle sent and chosen by God himself. Sure. Now, my opinion is that those Easter messages would weird out more normie voters than the uh, current president saying nice things to trans people. But what do you think? I feel like stories like this are when I feel the most like I'm either in a time machine or uh, stuck in a sort of broken, endless loop of Trump. Because yeah. this happens all the time. We get outraged. I think his followers f kind of find it ironic and funny, I guess. Um, some of the white Christian evangelicals probably believe more than we'd like to admit that he is some flawed vehicle from Christ. They do. <laughs> to, to do his bidding. Now, obviously, Trump likes this response because this is essentially a format he uses. I Googled a random holiday just to see if there was a good example, John. This is, I Googled um, Trump Veterans Day comments. This is from Veterans Day speech last year. We pledge to you that we will root out the communist, Marxist, fascist, and the radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country that lie and steal and cheat on elections. So I think we actually covered that. Was that Christmas? No, that was Veterans oh, Day. Oh, Veterans Day. Sorry. 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 So <laughs> I don't know. I, I like, There are probably a lot of voters. We know from polling. There are voters who hate this side of him. They hate the tweets and the cruelty. But I don't know. I think the normies don't like this. Normies don't like it. They'll probably I don't think they'll hear, hear about it. it. Exactly. That's the thing is I think we need to like – I mean it – just the idea, or and and by the way, there's a not, lot of normies, normie voters who are religious, who are Christians or Catholic or or whatever, and um, they don't think that they're not Trump supporters. They don't think that he is some god. They don't think he is like Jesus. No, probably not. <laughs> and when he compares himself to Jesus and then spends Easter 
just attacking random people and never mentions Jesus, uh, they probably think that's weird. They probably think that's fucking, if they, if they heard about it, they would think that's fucking weird. Yeah, it is weird. I think though, the religious in our, the, look, the evangelical Christians have been all in on Trump and the kind of normie voter religious folks, I don't know, they don't talk about it too much. So yeah. it hasn't got a lot of blowback. The thing I do wonder about is, um, we used to talk about how people wanted politics to be boring again and that Joe Biden was kind of the answer there. I wonder if that was a lie. I wonder if we all got hooked on the like weird Trump fentanyl of the vicious shit talking, you know, it's just like jarringly different than what we're used to, that people kind of miss this stuff. That's my my fear. Yeah, I think we we like it, (laughs) meaning we the highly politically engaged people who like follow this stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we obviously hate Trump. And are doing everything we can to uh, avoid him being elected. But I do think there is a a very online or very like attentive to politics type of person who sees all this and is just like, you know, this is like every day and we're all caught up in it. I think that most most people, first of all, like you said, I think it's what you said. They're not paying attention to this. Most will never see most this. Most people will never hear about this controversy. Um, though if I was the Biden people, I, I don't know. I I do some targeted advertising about uh, Trump, the fake religious asshole who's always talking about how he's persecuted because it does fit back into the overall message about him that he only fucking cares about himself. One of the posts said uh, that Trump posted this from a, from a supporter said, it's ironic that Christ walked through his greatest persecution the very week they are trying to steal your property from you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ dying for mankind's sins uh, is much like Trump's inability to post half a billion dollars bond because he committed business fraud and was held liable for it. <laughs> just... Do you remember when Trump was asked by uh, a reporter who shall not be named what his favorite Bible passage was? Oh. And he was like, uh, I forgot about Corinthians this. 2 or something. He just got it completely wrong. It was clear he'd never read a single Bible passage. I saw this. Um, remember that McKay Coppins Atlantic piece in 2016? Yes. And the headline is Trump secretly mocks his Christian supporters. Yes. It's all he knows. It's, it's all out there and they never care. Yep. They never care. He, he does their bidding on abortion. Yeah. Meanwhile, Joe Biden's message on Easter. Easter reminds us of the power of hope and the promise of Christ's resurrection. As we gather with loved ones, we remember Jesus' sacrifice. There's Joe Biden. There you go. (laughs) All right. In other Trump news, uh, his search for a running mate to replace the guy his mob almost hung is reportedly getting serious. Lots of interest in this job. Uh, Don't know why. Politico says the campaign is currently busy vetting a list that includes the following candidates. Tim Scott, J.D. Vance, Katie Britt, Marco Rubio, South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem, North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, all the Dakotas, uh, Arkansas Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders, Florida Representative Byron Donalds, and Tulsi Gabbard, uh, former representative from Hawaii, former Democrat turned crazy person. Um, and here's a dark horse from convicted felon Roger Stone. Got a so, name? Uh, uh, you know who I'd like? I just thought of this last night. Devin Nunes, 20-year member of Congress, former chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, someone Donald Trump is very close to and trusts entirely, Hispanic, a former farmer before he went to Congress. I think he'd be an excellent choice. Not Hispanic. I think he's Portuguese. He's not. Yeah, he's <laughs> yeah. Portuguese, not Hispanic. Very different. Currently running Truth Social, yeah. uh, a big, huge scam. Seems so that's a great choice. Funny. Uh, all right. So we have been waiting patiently and responsibly for the Republican primary to end before engaging in silly and ultimately pointless VP speculation. Now we get to let it yeah, rip. let's go. All right, here's a few questions. Who on that list do you think gives Trump the biggest political benefit? Okay, uh, we'll see what you think about this one. And by the way, the quote was, the Bible means a lot to me, but I don't want to get into specifics. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, great answer if you don't know. That was the funniest thing. It's a great What's answer. What's a Bible passage that means a lot to you? I don't want I don't to get, get into specifics. <laughs> I don't want to spoil it. I don't want to spoil it. Read for, what are the pe- people who haven't read it? You got to read it yourself. It's truly the funniest thing ever. Amazing. Okay, what do you think about this? On paper, mm-hmm. I kind of think the most valuable pick could be Tulsi Gabbard. What? Uh, yeah. No Wait way. for it. Stick okay. with me. Stick with me. Give it to me. Give it to me. Okay. Because if you pick a Democrat, that is the most surprising thing he could do. It is the biggest tent argument, right? It's like Is she still a Democrat? No, but she was one. Okay. And they but you can say former. She's elected yeah, yeah. Democrat. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, so you could make that argument that, like, I'm, um, you can't call me too partisan. He picked the Democrat for his VP, right? So it's a big tent thing. And then also uh, Trump knows that Republicans are struggling with women. Uh, especially after the Dobbs decision, and you could see Tulsi as an asset there. Now, that's on paper. In practice, she's really weird. 
So there's and that. And she's, she's really weird and just gotten weirder, steadily yeah. weirder over time. Remember the messages to Putin, like to camera? Yeah, she's videos. got a little, she's a little too, um, little too Putin friendly. Just, just very weird. She, she would do the very, like the RFK Jr. type, like, I'm anti-war, anti-establishment, anti yes. like populist, yes. right? Like she would go She's there. She's in the military. So I could yeah, it's you know what? You sort of I know. You make a good case. Call me Roger Stone. You make a better case than I expected for Tulsi Gabbard. Who's your number 1? Tim Scott. Okay. I think I think for political benefit, uh I I he's the one I worry about because mm-hmm. I think he could create a permission structure for disengaged black voters, especially black men, young black men who uh, don't like either candidate. Yep. Um, and the permission structure will allow them to back Trump. Because, and these, these are, by the way, these would be voters who do not pay close attention to politics, are not partisan Democrats, consider themselves moderate, who, by the way, are the, if we're, to the extent that Democrats um, have an, an issue with black voters, it is those black voters that, that the party's worried about that mm-hmm. have been drifting away from the party. And I think Tim Scott, again, if you haven't paid attention to the primary, He's young. He's seemingly genial. Like, and I and I think that Trump, I, I could see the campaign yeah. wanting that. And I, I could also uh, Kellyanne Conway made a pitch for him in a New York Times op-ed. So that's the one that I kind of worry about. Counterpoint: Too weird. <laughs> that's why I think that Trump might not want him. Yeah, there there is that's, some vibes there. I mean, I, I think Byron Donalds is similar. You can imagine mm. the campaign wanting an African American VP to help reach out to Black voters. He does create that similar permission structure. But also, a uh, CNN had a recent report about how much Byron Donald used to shit on Trump on Facebook, yeah. including comparing the birther attacks to being a 9-11 truther. <laughs> so you do think that one might sting well, a bit. And also, how many people are they going to have move out of Florida for Donald Trump? Because well, this, he's also from Florida, like just like Rubio. This gets you to my favorite option, which is you get Rubio to move out of Florida and then you don't pick him. <laughs> oh my God, I didn't think about that. <laughs> That's so funny. Because under the Constitution, you can't both be from the same state. You get him to move. Where, where, where can we have him Jersey. move? Jersey. <laughs> we get him to move to Jersey, and you just don't pick him. Just kidding, Jersey. That's such Probably a great idea. Probably pick this Georgia. Georgia. Uh, yeah, right. Um, Any others? Any other um, favorites you like? As terms of like helping him politically, I honestly don't think... I mean, there is the, like, he picks a woman, so that helps him yeah. politically. I don't know. It dep- I think it very much depends on who he picks. Like, I don't know how well... Christy Nome wears after oh, a while. Yeah. She's like selling veneers. You know, <laughs> She's, what, that's why weird. is she doing teeth ads? I don't for know. Out of state. I don't. Dentists? I don't think Sarah Huckabee Sanders gets you much. No. Right. What if she Doug Burgum writes a big check? That that well, uh-huh. that's. I guess that could, would help him politically. A big check. Yeah. yeah that's that's a possibility. Katie Britt. I wonder. Like right now, she's super mockable because of the State of the Union response. People who know her were sort of surprised how bad she was. So I wonder if she could possibly fix that over time. Yeah. And now her expectations are low. But I think honestly, I think most of these people are like a just a net neutral. Like right. I don't think they help or hurt politically. Though I do, like I said, I do worry about Tim Scott a little. Well, bit. with Katie Britt, there's a non-zero chance that she uh, crawls through your TV and kills you, like the girl in the ring. I know. It's like, can she shake that? Can she so, shake that weird? I don't know. I don't know. But uh, in terms of the negatives generally, I mean. I do think the downside to Brit, uh, Christy Nome, Byron Donalds, Tulsi, and to probably a lesser extent, J.D. Vance, is that they are just less well-known. Mm. And so you have more of an opportunity to define them. Um, you you probably remember this. Actually, you might you guys might have all been at the convention. When McCain picked Palin, we were sitting around at Obama HQ, like literally Googling her name and mm. learning about her for the first time and also finding brutal opposition research hits on her in real time. And she's obviously like a singularly terrible pick. But there was a bit of this with Pence, too, because people didn't really know him that well outside of D.C. And they were digging up his old columns, like attacking Mulan or whatever. And, you know, there was there was a lot of space there to define them nationally. Well, and Pence turned out to be just a nothing burger. Yeah. Right. Like didn't help him, didn't hurt him, was just there. Just around. Which is exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Until he almost wasn't. (laughs) Um, Which is exactly what Donald Trump wants. Right. Like he doesn't Mm -hmm. want anyone to outshine him. Mm -hmm. He just wants someone to be loyal, sent next to him and then uh, overturn the election if he needs them. Right. Exactly. That's all he wants. Exactly. So uh, do you think there would there's anyone who would be a political net negative like a Sarah Palin? Like I don't I can't. I don't know if there's anyone in this crowd. Like maybe Gabbard, if she goes, yeah, sideways. She's got the sideways <laughs> potential. Not not an obvious one, but I do think the lesser known ones create the most risk for you. I think that Rubio, and this is the Byron Donalds problem too. I think like 
playing clip after clip of Marco Rubio saying what he said about Donald Trump as he's the running mate is a problem. Yeah, that would not go well. I don't think it would. It would not wear well. All right. Who do you think would be the worst slash scariest president uh, if Trump gets the hamburger from heaven and this VP becomes president? So setting aside the Katie Britt crawl through your TV like the girl from the ring thing, um, <laughs> J.D. Vance, I think, to me. That's awesome. That was mine, yeah, too. Yeah. You probably read the long political piece I did. I didn't. No. Oh. You're a better reader than I. <laughs> well, <laughs> lucky you then, John. I get to tell you about it. Um, I, what it told me was that he is uh, more sincerely committed to the America first uh, white Christian nationalist project that we're seeing out of the... Heritage Foundation and these other think tanks than I thought. And maybe it's a different project than Trump. Um, and it made my hair stand on end and worry about him. The question with him has always been like, is he the J.D. Vance from uh, his book that seemed more reasonable? Hillbilly and, yeah, Hillbilly Elegy. Elegy, which I read at the time. I thought it was pretty good. And yeah. I know you're not allowed to say that anymore. In, no, no, I did. I, in yeah. uh, Twitter circles. But <laughs> um, it was interesting. And it seemed like an effort to better understand people's problems and solve them. I think he was wrong about all his solutions. But uh, the J.D. Vance that we've all gotten to know since is scary and isolationist in bad ways and just a bad person and a demagogue. And I actually don't think he is uh, bullshitting us. No, like, I think I he him. has been radicalized. I agree. And I think he's pretty smart, certainly smarter than Trump. I kind of think he's like what people thought DeSantis might be, mm -hmm. but like the real the yeah, real deal. Smarter DeSantis. So I do. I worry about him a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, now getting inside Trump's mind, which is always fun. Who do you it. think he wants, and who do you think the campaign wants? I've already. I think the campaign wants Scott, maybe Rubio. They they want uh, someone to help with certain demographics. That, that'd be my guess. I mean, listen, if you're Donald Trump and you're picking like a roll dog and someone that you got to have around all the time, I think he probably wants JD. Mm. They seem like they, they seem like there's kind of a buddy buddy thing going on. I think Don Jr. Um, is friends with J.D. Vance, which Trump won't totally hold against him. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, <laughs> it's out there. So I could see them being buddies. And uh, there also seems to be a genuine friendship relationship with Christy Nome that I don't totally understand. Also, you know, d Trump presentation person, right? He's a central casting. Look at the, yes. yes, look at yes. this attractive woman that I yep. have as my running man. And he, he feels like that about men, too. You have to look good. To be around Trump. To fly Air Force One, you have to be smoking hot. <laughs> you have to look like Tom Cruise, but better. Even though that has not worked out for him with some of the people that he has had around him, but that is what you, he says that. He talks about it. No, all the generals are out of central casting. Yes, sir, they're all. Yeah, he does it. When he's like they're manly and they're tough exactly, and they're big, yeah. bur big muscles. You know. Um, okay, so Trump has also been cozying up to some Wall Street billionaires. Uh, if Doug Burgum doesn't come through with the check, um, both as potential Treasury secretaries and donors to his cash-strapped campaign. He's got a fundraiser in Palm Beach uh, this weekend on Saturday that his campaign claims will raise $33 million, which would break Biden's record of $25 million from last week's event with uh, Obama and Clinton. Uh, Trump's is being co-hosted by billionaire hedge fund manager John Paulson, who famously got rich off the subprime mortgage crisis nice. and is now uh, reportedly a candidate for Treasury Secretary. Great. Uh, there's also a bunch of rich people uh, going who at one time or another said they were done with Trump. Uh, one donor told the Wall Street Journal, quote, there are a lot of Wall Street people who tried everything else and are in the process of coming back to the party and Trump. Ah, oh, well, they didn't uh, they didn't like the attempted coup and insurrection. But, uh, you know, what's really, really bad. Margin, a higher marginal tax rate. That was Melania, right? That quote. That, is that what you're... <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. So let me channel my inner um, Ben LeBolt for a second, White House communications director. If I were a reporter covering the Trump campaign, I would probably wait to see some receipts before I reported that it was going to raise thirty-three million dollars at uh, an event. Yeah, that's it's possible. A good point. But the Biden fundraiser with Obama, Bill Clinton, Stephen Colbert at Radio City, a venue that seats like 5,000 people, raised $25 million. Mm -hmm. And that was like unheard of. I couldn't believe it when I saw those numbers. So again, like this event with Trump could raise $33 million. The reason is because of a bunch of Supreme Court rulings that did away with donation caps. Uh, and now if you're a Democrat, you can be asked to write a check for $929,600 to the Joint <laughs> Fundraising Committee that goes to the Biden campaign, the DNC, uh, Democratic State Parties. That's before you get the super PAC. So basically, God help you if you're a rich Democrat and uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg has your number. <laughs> That's going to be bad. That call is coming. But uh, So who knows? Like Maybe they can find 40 billionaires to write like an $800,000 some odd check uh, yeah. to the Trump victory fund. But I, don't, I doubt it. 
I just I, I know it shouldn't be surprising, but these fucking billionaires coming back to Trump who were like, yeah, no more after January 6th. You know, they all wrote their little missives and maybe it was on Twitter or maybe it was on their email list to their rich friends. You know, never again. No more Trump. And now yep. they're only back because they only give a shit about themselves and their money. And uh, they're, that's who they're going to. They're just like Trump. Right. Like and they're going to take care of rich people if they get back to the White House and he gets back to the White House and they play a role in it and it's all a scam. These people all think that Trump voters are fucking rubes. Yep. They have no respect for him. Um, they just don't care. It's just like how Trump feels about the uh, evangelical Christians, feels the same way about his other voters. It's just, he just wants rich friends around. That's all he wants. We love the rubes. You can we- imagine saying it at, the, at an event. <laughs> I mean, we dealt with this same stuff in the Obama years. We had a bunch of Wall Street types support Obama because they thought he was inspiring. They were ready to move on from the Bush years. And then they got really sad because during the financial crisis, there was rhetoric coming out of the Democratic Party in the White House that was anti-Wall Street. That's right, listeners. You might be surprised to learn that uh, the big thing that we dealt with in that first year was people angry at Obama because he was too tough on Wall Street. Because <laughs> their feelings their feelings were all hurt because, I don't know, they almost ruined the global economy and we had to remind them that you know, this administration is the reason there aren't people with pitchforks in your office right now. But yeah, anyway. and we didn't want to like give them more bonuses that paid for by the fucking taxpayers. Like, yeah, anyway. but you know, look, I, I think the challenge is always going to be that at the end of the day, these donations are investments for Republicans because they pay off a bunch of Republicans now and they cut their taxes later. Yeah. If you're supporting a Democrat, you're probably going to get your taxes increased if it can get through Congress, which, you know, will be difficult, but. And that's what these people really care about. Honestly, that's what like that's fucking Elon Musk cares about. That's what uh, David Sachs cares about. That's what all these people—they just taxes regulation. They feel, you know, they feel attacked because all they do is just like sit on Twitter, sit on social media, and have their brains poisoned by the internet. And then they're worried that someone's coming for their money. Yeah, that's yeah. I, I think the richer you get, the more paranoid you get. Two quick things on fundraising that I just wanted to flag. Did you see that today Trump sent an April Fool's fundraising email? With the subject line, I'm suspending my campaign. I did see that. <laughs> and then at the bottom, he said, just April Fool's, just kidding. I will never surrender. <laughs> I will never like, surrender. Easy, buddy. Um, but uh, Josh Dossie from uh, Washington Post had a great story about how uh, Republicans are having a hard time with small dollar fundraising because mm. they just abuse their donors and their lists with <laughs> messages like that. Yeah. Um, and I guess they talked to the, the story talked about how. Uh, I'll just say Democrats and glass houses. Oh, well, listen, if you guys, <laughs> if, if you, I texting stop is my kink, it's all I do. <laughs> I complained about it. All my friends complained about it. Hannah was complaining about it the other awful. day. It's awful. It's um, awful. The story talked about how they've been trying to diversify away from only Trump messaging because that was doing the best, but they were like doing it too often. Uh, but they've been struggling. And it said, quote, one such message, a sweepstakes to meet Pence raised less than $500, <laughs> according to people familiar with the 2022 sweepstakes. So again- Who, uh, Whose message was that to meet Pence? It was a donor email uh, where you could, you could win a sweepstakes to <laughs> meet Mike Pence. And it raised 500 bucks. I'll tell you so a message funny. about Mike Pence that would have raised some more I know, money. I know. Not, it would have been hang out with Mike Pence, but not hang yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, a little different. I mean? Yeah, tweak it. Um, so it does seem like Trump really needs all this money. Did you see that he lost a billion dollars today, uh, Monday, after shares of his uh, fake media company dropped by 20%? So yeah, DJT, the stock, ended the day down 21%, <laughs> which I, I don't know. I guess they, they, they filed some paperwork that showed uh, they lost $58 million, so that's not good. Yeah, that's not, you're not uh, good when you, in one year, in 20, they, in, yeah, in 2023, $58 million. Yeah, and they, uh, and they generated $4.1 million in revenue, which is not great. But I mean, I, it was surprising to me to see it drop 20% because, again, this is not a financially viable company at the moment. <laughs> and they're not trading on fundamentals. This is an, I'm not, uh, not Apple. Uh, there's no price to equity. It's a meme stock. And so, I don't know. I, I think we're all just waiting to see if Trump gets permission to to dump shares early from his board. I know. and I, But I wonder, I, I saw something that if he, if even if, if they vote to let him dump his shares early, they could be, like that could be an SEC violation mm-hmm. because they're not, they're not, they don't have the interest of the company you in mind son, there. Yeah. Right? Um, I also wonder if part of the drop was due to, like in that filing, uh, the company accountants warned um, that the losses are so severe that they, quote, raise substantial doubt about the company's ability to continue. <laughs> yeah, well, so the point of the SPAC merger is they SPAC, they, they merged with that DWAC company, mm-hmm. and they should now have access to $300 million because of that merger to run and grow the thing. But, you know, it sounds like they're burning through that pretty fast. 
It, uh, DJT is also the most heavily shorted stock, I think, in the entire stock market right mm. now. So a lot of investors are betting it will go down. Um, but yeah, the value of the Trump shares went from $6 billion last week to $3.7 billion today. So that's a tough week. That said, it could all go back up. It's not trading on fundamentals. It's momentum and FOMO, like a meme stock, like the I, I, crypto. Is this going to like follow the polls, do we think? I think so. I mean, I think ultimately this is a bet on him winning. Yeah. You know? But um, until then, like, you know, there's all these shit coins and, you know, cryptocurrencies, like the Pepe coin. It's got a $3 billion market cap. Like, there's Just there are people who like to buy this stuff. It's grift all the way down. Yeah, it's fun. Today's presenting sponsor is Simply Safe Home Security. It's April 2nd. Making it through April Fool's Day unscathed. <sighs> I fall for him. I do. I get I, nailed. I'm so I gullible. I believe it. I believe yeah. everything. Why would someone just lie to me? Yeah, maybe re there really is going to be a hot dog flavored LaCroix, you know? <laughs> I'll believe it. I'll believe it every goddamn time. But here's something that isn't a prank. <laughs> the home Masterful security you pivot. get from Simply Safe. That's no jape. That's the real deal. Now I'm not pulling your leg. Hey. Huh? Trusted by experts, Simply Safe was named Best Home Security System for 2024 by US News and World Report and Newsweek awarded it Best Customer Service in Home Security. Simply Safe is great at preventing the unexpected, like having your home egged. That's more of an October thing, as well as break ins, fires, and floods. It's advanced home security with indoor and outdoor cameras powered by 24 7 professional monitoring for less than $1 a day. The system blankets your whole home in protection. It has sensors to detect break-ins, fires, floods, and more, plus a variety of indoor and outdoor cameras to keep watch over your property day and night. Professional monitoring agents can even help stop crime in real time by speaking to intruders through the wireless indoor camera, warning them that they're being recorded and that police are on the way. With no contract and a 60-day money-back guarantee, you can try Simply Safe risk-free. Don't absolutely love it? Send the system back for a full refund. Protect your home today. Our listeners get a special 20% off any new Simply Safe system when you sign up for Fast Protect monitoring. Just visit simplysafecom slash crooked. That's simplysafecom slash crooked. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Pod Save America is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Love it or leave it and Ponce of America are heading out on tour Ooh. and there was a, there was a pre-sale code. Now we're in the general sale and that's how you could have gotten really great seats. When you want the best, you have to act quickly. Back fast. Or someone else will get it instead. It's like if you're hiring for your business, you want to find the most talented people for your open roles before the competition scoops them up. So what's the best way to do that? ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter finds the qualified candidates fast. And right now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. ZipRecruiter's powerful matching technology takes center stage to identify top talent for your roles immediately after you post your job. ZipRecruiter's smart technology starts showing you qualified people for it. Amp up your hiring performance with ZipRecruiter and find the best fast. See why four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. Just go to this exclusive web address right now. Try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. So after a two week break from campaigning, Trump is in Wisconsin and Michigan this week where his campaign says he'll give remarks on, quote, Biden's border bloodbath. Just owning the bloodbath. Biden's border bloodbath. I know, it's, it's a lot of bees. A lot of bees. Uh, this comes after Trump posted a video last weekend that includes an image of Joe Biden hogtied in the back of a pickup truck and several posts where he attacks the daughter of Judge Juan Mershon, shares her name and picture, and says that her father should be removed from the hush money case because... She apparently runs a consulting firm that apparently sometimes works with Democrats. Uh, Alvin Bragg, the district attorney, responded by asking the judge for a broader gag order. There's already one in place on Trump um, that also protects the judge and his family. So certainly not the first time any of this has happened. Uh, obviously worries people like us. Do you think it resonates or breaks through with most voters? The Biden campaign today actually held a press conference and they had some uh, ahead of this trip by Trump to Wisconsin and Michigan, and they had some a couple police officers who served on January 6th sort of talking about Trump's threats of violence, how he incites violence, and sort of the effects that it had. Yeah, I, th I think that strategy is smart. I think if you can, if you treat it as a one-off, it probably won't work, especially the, the image of Biden hogtied on a truck. I mean, that's sort of like, I don't know, some weirdo's truck. It's kind of truck nuts adjacent. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I don't know that people... The whole thing's weird. It's just, it's just odd, right? The attack on the family of a judge is wild. And I do think it's just worth pausing for a second that Trump, just to explain what's happening, Trump is attacking the adult daughter of a New York Supreme Court judge and saying her political affiliations mean her father can't be fair and impartial. Meanwhile, the classified documents case in Florida is being overseen by yeah, Aileen Cannon, point, point. who Trump literally appointed to the job. And by the way, if these things get appealed up to the Supreme Court, there'll be three more Trump appointees there just waiting to bail him out. So that we're like, we're already in such a dumb place. The, the, the fact that we're debating this 
uh, in calling it sort of rigged and unfair to him as opposed to him literally being before a judge who he gave the job to is absurd on its face. But I do think on the violence point, like one off people will probably just not see it or pay attention to it. But making it a broader story that ties back to Jan 6, I do think that's real. I do, too. And I think it's important for, again, like there's people who are tuned into politics like us. And then there's people who aren't, which is most voters. And there's also a a, for people who think that Trump bears just some responsibility for January 6th, which is like a good chunk of voters. They think, you know, they think he was bad, but they don't quite think it was all his fault. Mm -hmm. Right. And not necessarily Trump supporters either, just like sort of undecided, moderate in, in the middle of voters. I think for them, the most effective arguments is like what Trump will do if he gets a second term that could incite violence. Definitely. So releasing a bunch of people from prison who were convicted by a jury of their peers for beating the shit out of police officers on January 6th. I think people would not like that. The fact that he and his advisors have talked about invoking the Insurrection, Insurrection Act so that he deploys the U.S. military against fucking protesters. Yeah, that's not that's, good. That seems scary. Like the fact that he said uh, police officers should be able to uh, shoot suspected shoplifters on the spot when they walk out of a store. Like those are the things that I think are those are more powerful arguments just because – a, he said them and promised them or whatever else. And people can say, oh, God, if he if he becomes president, that kind of that kind of world could we could be living in that kind of world. Yeah, it's certainly the case that it's weird and wrong to tweet out a photo of your political opponent being hogtied and I don't know taken somewhere for to do bad things to them. Um, it, it is part of a broader pattern of him, I think, normalizing political violence and celebrating it. I mean, I've forgotten about the comments about shooting shoplifters, but it also reminded me of when he was speaking before a bunch of police and he talked about how he encouraged them to rough suspects up when they shove them in the car and stuff. And now he's got a policy to match that yeah. for the second term. He wants to uh, indemnify all police officers in the whole country, yeah. which is going to be hard to do for, as a federal law, but like it's same thing. He wants mandatory stop and frisk in every community in the country and he's going to cut federal funding to any locality that doesn't have mandatory stop and frisk deportation raids they're going to go into cities and have like again armed soldiers and agents of the state knocking on people's doors raiding workplaces and checking for people's papers to see if they're actual citizens like all that stuff has uh, like is, is more likely to cause violence than any kind of image yeah and listen i i think obviously people saw the police brutality spill out into the public yep. space and around George Floyd's murder. And, you know, I, I think a lot of those things go way too far. Yeah. And actually, if you explain to an average voter that you want stop and frisk in every community, they would think that's crazy. I totally look, agree. A lot of this is racist. Yeah. And it's a lot of people who don't live in big cities like New York and L.A. being like, uh, those people in those cities read people of color need different laws to keep the city safe than I do in my community in Ohio or whatever yeah. it is. Um, so I'm not sure that that would I, I don't know. I, I do. He does have a big advantage on crime and immigration, um, but I, that's a bridge too far. Yeah. And I, I think what you said, like the Biden campaign using, you know, this controversy to then do a press conference with police officers, like taking it back to January 6th, I think is very smart because I think that really resonates with yeah, people. Not, you can't just be like Twitter outreach bait. Yeah. So uh, Biden campaign is also stepping up its uh, outreach to Republicans, uh, especially Nikki Haley voters who aren't yet sure if they'll support Trump in November. Uh, the campaign is out with a new digital ad that Biden tweeted with the message, Nikki Haley voters, Donald Trump doesn't want your vote. I want to be clear. There's a place for you in my campaign. And here's the ad. Bird brain. I call it bird brain. He is, she's gone haywire. There aren't that many never Trumpers anymore. How do you bring these Nikki Haley voters back into the town? I'm not sure we need too many. So seems like a smart move to me. I'm interested to hear what you think. Uh, our pal Jonathan Martin has a piece out in Politico where he argues that Biden himself hasn't done enough outreach to Republican politicians who've said they don't want to support Trump. People like Haley, Chris Christie, Mike Pence, Larry Hogan, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think's going on there? I, I think the ad's smart. I think we need to be, build the biggest, broadest coalition possible. Again, from from never Trump to I guess from maybe Trump to DSA left. And yeah. I think uh, criticizing outreach to any one of those communities is stupid. And I think we need to learn from the left and other countries to figure out how to build big coalitions in terms of the Jonathan Martin piece. It was, it was interesting. I, I didn't, I was, it surprised me. Me too. Um, Larry Hogan is the one exception in there because he's running for Senate yeah. in Maryland and he's Good point. kind of winning at the moment. Right. Um, or I, I, though I was wondering if in J Mart's piece, the point was like, maybe he should have reached out to Larry Hogan before he jumped into yeah, the Senate race. That's possible. That's possible. But at the end of the day, I mean, 
these guys have big egos. They need some love and some coaxing to your side. And if you think about it just in terms of psychological terms, I mean, if you're a Chris Christie, your entire life is built around your identity as a Republican elected official, your friends, your donors, your coworkers, right? Like you need to feel some sort of pull and love from the other side that you'll be welcome. And we're not necessarily very good at that in the Democratic Party. We love to just shit on people and, and never let them be forgive for their past political sins. Right. Um, and, and then we have debates about whether it's like morally right or wrong to do that. Put that aside. It's just about election. politics. Do yeah. we want to win the election or not? Yeah, I'm not saying that you um, you buy your children biographies of these people and, and treat them like a mentor. Just yeah. like, let's get their votes. Let's get their endorsements. You don't have to nominate them for the Profile and Courage Award. Yeah, and you know what? Like Chris Christie's an effective messenger. And he's someone who is very close with Trump and can attack him in personal ways and get in his head and reach a certain subset of voters. So I don't know. Mike Pence, maybe not the best use of time. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd be having Joe Biden call Mike Pence, but a, I don't know. Who cares? Give him a call. What does it hurt? I, it's probably the first time his phone would ring in like a, <laughs> a year and a half. So I was I was really wondering like what's going on there. And the, there's only two explanations I can think of. One, it was just too early and like they're going to get to it and they're just starting to like yeah, yeah, start yeah. the campaign now. So maybe that was it, even though I think right now is not too early at this stage in April. Um but then the second one is like, are they worried about progressive blowback if it leaks that he was calling all these people? But again, the campaign put out the ad look, at reaching out for Haley voters, so can't, they can't be too worried about that. And as J Mart says in the piece, like Biden of all people, he's still telling fucking stories about you know Strom Thurmond, like right. he he loves reaching out to Republicans. So I, I it, I'm confused. Yeah, my read on the current Gaza policy is not a ton of concern about lefty blowback <laughs> from people <laughs> like me. Listen, I think if you're mad that Joe Biden called Chris Christie, you probably should worry about other things you know and i I, so also, I think I, if you're mad about that like you're there, it's politics find me a person who was gonna vote for joe biden and then uh said no 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 no. he called mitt romney and chris christie i'm out yeah so find I, me that person I, I think it would be worth calling mitt romney it'd be worth calling chris christie it'd be worth i don't know i guess lobbing a call to mike but send him an email send pence an email <laughs> and again but, no one's saying you have to like just give them a policy win here. Right. You don't you're not giving them anything. This is not a negotiation. It's uh it's a it's a political touch to see if they'll come to your side. Yeah. I mean Mark Esper, uh the defense Trump's defense secretary, mm -hmm. who uh, you know, said a couple weeks ago that Trump was like, Hey, uh, can't we have the military shoot the protesters, uh the George Floyd protesters? So that's that's him. Over the weekend he said, um, there's no way I'll vote for Trump. But every day Trump does something crazy, the door to voting for Biden opens a little more. And, and like that's the exact kind of person exactly. that we need. And that person is in a lonely place, yeah. right? Because they're just, they're bucking their party. He was run out of town by Trump. Trump criticized him personally. They called him Yesper. They made fun of him. They mocked him when he was defense secretary because he never should have had the job. He's a joke. Right. Yeah. He's a lobbyist. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, now he needs a little love from the top and uh, maybe he'll do an ad for you. That's that's all we're looking for here. We're just looking for some ads. Uh, all right. Before we go, we save the best for last, Tommy. Um, new RNC co-chair slash aspiring pop star Lara Trump released a new single on Friday called Anything is Possible, of which her career trajectory is certainly living proof. Um, <laughs> here's a sample of the sure to be chart topping banger. Talking to that little girl. Jesus Christ. Riding on the Pegasus. Oh, it's so. Oh. Tell her everything's gonna be alright. So don't think, just jump. You can't give up. Know that anything is possible. Oh, oh. What is the Pegasus? Saul made that clip too long. Yeah, it's really long. <laughs> I immortal winged horse okay i can't ever look I, that is i didn't think i'd have like third hand embarrassment for someone like larry trump but i genuinely do her don't back down cover first of all you can't cover like an iconic tom petty song when you have no talent <laughs> like that's what you should get that should be the last thing you cover i i sent that other larry trump song we just heard to my friend Ryan, who you know well, yeah. lives in LA here. He went to Berkeley, played at a bunch of really big bands. He runs um, studio sessions for huge artists. He mixes. He's a tremendous musician. He's like himself. one of the, he's a musical genius. He does scores TV and film now. He was so offended <laughs> by the production quality. Oh, interesting. <laughs> he was right? like the, the auto tune. He like, sounds like a nasal robot. She uh, does sound like a nasal, yeah. The, the engineering upset him. And I think he was just so mad because he knows, like if you're rich, Pay someone to make you sound good. That was she didn't even do that. Fucking horrific. So, not to be outdone, 
The DNC responded with their own self-described summer party anthem about Larry Trump and the RNC called Party's Fallen Down. Let's listen. Larry Trump, what's going on? You're running the RNC, but it's a sad song. Oh, Laura, Laura, what have you done? The party's falling down, it's no longer fun. Oh, Laura, Laura, can't you see? The leadership's sinking on your peak. Okay. <sighs> Uh, how many times have you listened to each song since Friday? Have so, you had that on repeat? Laura, I can't do it. I can't More or less than it, Cowboy Carter. Me. <laughs> the, I, I see, did the DNC one, was it just AI generated? I think it was. Um, actually, I have a lot of questions about the DNC one, which is like, was it AI generated? How long did it take to put that together? I hope the answer is 10 minutes. I think it was probably not a lot of time. Yeah. And it also In which case, is, fine. Look, uh, for... <laughs> Everyone knows this. Music is formulaic, and that song will probably be playing at like Ultra in Miami next year or something. <laughs> but um, yeah, I kind of like them trolling her. The more time Lara Trump spends in the studio, the less time she's fundraising or whatever. I don't know what she'll be doing. I mean, all the money. What's amazing about this? It, this really is like Banana Republic shit. Trump in, installs his daughter-in-law at the RNC. She greenlights this fundraising waterfall where. All the checks that come in to the Trump fundraising committee first go to his PAC that does legal defense. She funds. purges the entire committee. Purging the staff. She's asking people if they're election deniers yeah, before they can get hired. Yeah, you have to you have to say the sky is red before you can get a job. You, you there. probably have to say her song is fucking awesome. Too. Yeah, you do. Now, all that said, Trump could still win. It's fifty <laughs> fifty. So I don't know what that says about us. I just had an idea. What I think that you and uh, our pal Brian Tyler Cohen mm. should do. Uh, liberal uh, tears, oh no. where you draft worst political songs. Oh, that's good. Like the Hillary in the House song. That's a great song. The why uh, did you ever say that? Well, <laughs> I'm saying that maybe. It's, oh, I guess it's. I guess you guys always do the worst because it's a thing. beautiful song, <laughs> Hillary in the House. What about the uh, Obama girl? Remember from? Uh, oh, <laughs> that was tough. There's just there's Mitt Romney singing "Who Let the Dogs Out." I mean, there's a. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Right? Mitt Romney. I think this is a whole episode. Mitt, Mitt Romney just stumbling into a photo with like four or five younger black males. And the only thing he could think to say was who let the dogs out. It was and so then he said, who, who, who. horribly, yeah. horribly embarrassing. Anyway, there's uh, a rich history of these. Will I Am. Oh, yeah. yeah Will yeah, I Am yeah, turned, our, turned our speech into a song. Not ours, pal. Yours. <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of, bunch of celebs were in that. What was it? The t- 2008. It was weird times. Yeah. Better times. Um, Better times, but weird times. The, the, the cringe was embraced and it was mainstream and it didn't feel like cringe in the moment it felt this, a little more hopeful this felt pretty cringe although i i had our staff was uh cringing about the parties falling down i had not listened to that mm-hmm. but i'd also not listened to the larry trump thing the, the parties falling down is like haha cringe whatever the larry trump thing is is like i don't think i can listen to it again her range is like half an octave i did it for this pod and i did it once before no. this pod and i don't think i can ever do it again. she's singing from up within her nose it's something just so <laughs> nasal Anyway, I wish her all the best. Um, all right, few quick housekeeping notes before we go. Um, if you haven't heard yet, we're hitting the road. Pods of America's hitting the road this summer for the Democracy or Else tour. If you're in Brooklyn, Boston, Madison, Phoenix, Philly, or Ann Arbor, or coming to your city, VIP tickets include a signed copy of our book, Democracy or Else, How to Save America in 10 Easy Steps and more exclusive merch. And you know what? We finished signing all the copies. Oh, it took like hours and hours. So many copies. Um, check out Pod Save America plus Love It or Leave It tour dates at cricket.com slash events. Also, uh, we were mentioning this outreach to uh, Haley voters. Well, if you want some actual facts behind it on the polling, Dan Pfeiffer's got you covered. Um, in the latest episode of Polar Coaster, uh, he talks to guest Alyssa Cass about um, the Haley voters that could absolutely swing the election. I just listened to the episode this morning. It's fantastic. Take a look. But to get access to this series and other subscriber exclusives, you got to head to crooked.com slash friends. A woman in the house, the White House. Hillary in the White House. Hillary in the house. Hey, hey. Four hundred fourteen thousand views on this. Four hundred thousand of them are me. Yeah, yeah, us. I watched this so many times. You go, just everyone. You have to watch the video. So go, go, go to YouTube and just what what would you search for? Uh, Hillary in the house. If you know the guy in the bottom left corner with the beanie on doing the facial reactions, please get him in touch with me somehow. We should probably go to commercial now. Pokemon, go to the polls. <laughs>